One thing that we've learned in trying to combat all sorts of diseases, from cancer to viral infections like the one we're dealing with now, to diabetes mellitus, to just about anything, is that clinical advances arise because of scientific advances. And what you need to realize is that those two things are separate, those two worlds are separate. Clinic and medicine is not science. It, the practice of science is done independently of all of that. And our goal as scientists is to make discovery, discover how things work, and the medical clinical people take that information and use it to treat and diagnose disease. So that's our goal. And what we've learned is that the science drives the medicine. That's what's important. I want to give you an example of that. We've been dealing with this uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, and we know where it came from. Uh, or at least we have a good idea where it came from, pangolins, as we talked about earlier in this lecture. What I want to do now is to get into the science, get into our knowledge of what this virus is all about, so we can get a sense for how it is that we're going to treat it, uh, because that's the only real way that we can uh, move forward in this situation. So what I want to do is to start with this SARS coronavirus that we already know of, the SARS-CoV that had the outbreak in 2003-2004. Here's a picture of it. Uh, this right here is the coronavirus. It's called a coronavirus because of this. You can see this particular virion. That virion is the name of a single individual virus. It has this kind of crown around it. It has this, this stuff that sticks out. And that's what gives it its name. Corona means crown. So if you were to sort of look at this as a cartoon, like this picture here, uh, first of all, let's understand this picture is misleading. The viruses don't look quite like that, unless you cut them in half and you can look inside of them. Really, these viruses are spheres, and these proteins, these corona uh, particles, stick out all the way around it. But in the picture, it looks like they're flat. So this is the cartoon of it, and you can see a number of proteins embedded in this thing called the envelope. So where if you follow the cursor, this is following what's called an envelope. That's a membrane. But this is not a cell. This is far, far, far smaller than a cell. In fact, look at this bar right here. That's 100 nanometers long, and these virus particles are less than that, less than 100 nanometers. Now, remember, nanometer is one billionth of a meter. This is 100 billionths of a meter. So how does this compare to the size of a cell? Well, a typical cell is 10 micrometers in diameter. So they are um, one micrometer is 1,000 times bigger than one nanometer. So this is a tenth of a micron, and most cells are 10 microns. So this distance here from here to here is about 1 one hundredth the size of a cell. So these are tiny little things. And unlike cells, they don't have the structures that we've come to, to understand that, that, require, uh, that are required by living cells. In particular, they don't have ribosomes. If you remember, the ribosomes are what make the proteins. If you look inside this membrane, You'll only see a few proteins, and you'll see this one single strand of RNA, single-stranded RNA. That's the gene, the genome of this, of this uh, virus. That's all it is. And it's connected to a bunch of other proteins that are called N proteins, or nucleocapsid proteins. There's the term. The nucleocapsid proteins are there to sort of protect the RNA. And they don't do much else. Well, that's not strictly true. They do other things. But for our purposes, they, they don't do a lot. There are a number of other proteins that are embedded in this membrane, including these membrane glycoproteins, M proteins, and envelope proteins, E. And you'll see a number of other uh, things here later on. But the key protein that we need to focus on is this, these things sticking out here. And that's what forms the corona. These proteins are called spike proteins, or S. We abbreviate them simply as S. That's what you're seeing here. Each one of these things is a small spike protein. So this is the anatomy of the, of the virus that we're dealing with, of the, of the SARS coronavirus. This anatomy is necessary to understand how this virus actually works. And the thing you have to realize is that viruses are not cells. They can't re replicate themselves. For that reason, most biologists don't consider them to be alive. They have no capability of replicating themselves, or they require a host, a cell, to complete their replication. Whether or not they're cells, they still have genes, and they still have a genome. And in fact, their genome is one of the biggest genomes known of any virus. The whole region itself uh, is, is uh, quite large and made up of a bunch of different genes, and that's what this picture is, is depicting. Each one of these boxes is a gene or a coding region for a particular gene, and they're clustered into different uh, regions on the uh, five prime end, this is reading from five prime to three prime here. On the five prime end is this region that's called the replicase transcriptase complex. 
And uh, it's open reading frame 1A and 1B. ORF means open reading frame. Now, if you remember, we talked about earlier, the reading frame is the set of, of starting points and ending points for each of the codons. And this particular reading frame has, number one, has two parts to it. There's 1A and 1B because there's a frame shift that occurs right there. The 1A is read in one frame, 1B is read in a separate frame. But you can see a whole host of different proteins that are produced by that region. And that set of proteins right there is all about replicating the host genome, or sorry, the viral genome. On this end, on the 3' prime end, there is the coding region for the spike protein that I showed you before, and then a bunch of other proteins that are part of the structure of the, of the virus, including this N protein, the uh, nucleic capsid protein, and the envelope proteins and some of these others. So all of the genes that the virus needs are here, but what's missing that the virus needs are ribosomes. For that, it needs the host cell. So it has to infect a cell somehow. It has to get into a cell so that the cell will read those genes and then uh, make new viral particles by making new viral proteins. So that's what we know about the original SARS, the original SARS that started our, our uh, uh, severe uh, disease that we recognized in 2003-2004. Now, if you look at SARS-CoV-2, which is the one that's now, and there's another one that uh, came out in 2012 that I mentioned before, MERS uh, coronavirus, you'll see that they're extremely similar. Here's the first one we were looking at. And it's about 27.9 kilobases long, 27,900 kilobases, uh, 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 thousand bases. And this is just a set of reading frames that uh, is simplified here. This is open reading frame one and two. That's the replicase transcriptase complex. Here's all the structural stuff that was on the three prime end. And you can see if you compare it to the MERS and to SARS-CoV-2, there's a lot of similarity. See the spike protein is in the same location. Envelope proteins are almost in the same location, although MERS is a little bit off. The nucleic capsid proteins are in the same location and so on. There's some variation, but not a lot. Basically, these are very, very similar. That's why it is that we call SARS-CoV-2 SARS SARS-CoV-2 because it's so similar to the original sars coronavirus. So it's a coronavirus. That's what we know. And we also know then that it probably will follow the same pathology as the other coronaviruses. And in fact, clinically, it has a lot of similar behaviors. But it also has some very, very different behaviors. One of the things that we're discovering very, very recently, and literally within the last few days, is that this disease causes uh, organ failure all over the body, not just in the lungs, where most of these other SARS viruses have, uh, have their impact. So exactly what is it that SARS-CoV-2 is doing, and why is it so much worse than everything else that we've seen so far? That's what we need to get into. The answer to that question has to do with what this protein complex that this genome makes does and how it actually functions. Now, like we said before, if you look at this genome length, it's about 30,000 base pairs. And this particular section right here is showing you uh, a really, really simplified view of what the genome looks like. And it's this spike protein that we're going to focus a lot on because that's what was known first. What's astonishing is how fast we were able to figure most of this stuff out. But that was largely because we were able to compare it to the two known uh, SARS viruses, both SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS virus. So the question then is, how do all of these things work? Here's what I can't tell you. Well, how all of them work, we don't know yet. We do know a lot about the spike protein, so we're going to focus on that, see exactly what it is that the spike protein actually does. Now, here's what we know about the life cycle of coronaviruses in general. The virus looks like this, and then you've got the cell. Like I said, the virus cannot replicate itself. It can only be replicated within a cell, so it has to get itself into the cell somehow. What the other coronaviruses do is they use that spike protein to bind to another protein that's on the cell that they're going to infect, what we call the host cell. So here's the host cell membrane, here's the, here's the protein. What that protein is varies by, by the virus. But the spike protein will bind to that uh, receptor protein and become ingested by the cell, basically be pulled into the cell. Once it's in the cell, the virus particle breaks down and the uh, RNA molecule is released into the cytosol. Now, if you remember from before, the RNA molecules are understood when they're in the cytosol to be messenger RNA. And that's what the cell doesn't know that this is viral. It assumes it's messenger RNA. So what it then does is it does exactly what you'd expect it to do if it's messenger RNA. It binds ribosome to it, and the ribosome then makes a bunch of these proteins. Now, when it first makes the proteins, the protein comes out in this gigantic blob. 
and a protease, which is an enzyme that cuts proteins up, is going to come along and cut the giant viral polyprotein up into smaller functional proteins, and that's what's being shown here. So each one of these uh, things is being translated into a, into a particular protein, and once, it's, pro once it's, it's made, then those proteins are assembled into something that will become a virus that gets released. Now, this gets a little bit complicated. These proteins here, the spike protein, yes, the E envelope protein, the M protein that I showed you before, all of them are made by ribosomes that are found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now here's something I want you to write down. It's not on the slide, but you need to know it. Ribosomes can be found in two locations, either the cytosol or the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Those ribosomes that are on the rough, end, the rough ER will produce proteins that generally will be embedded in a membrane somewhere or be released by the cell and secreted. These proteins are being made by the rough ER because they're going to be embedded in a membrane. So all these proteins, S, E, and M, among others, get embedded in this membrane. They're made in the rough ER, and then they bud off of the rough ER as a vesicle, as this kind of a spherical blob, and that's sort of what's shown here. The other proteins that are made by the other ribosomes are made in the cytosol. So there are ribosomes that are in the cytosol, and those proteins that are made there generally are not going to be embedded in a membrane somewhere. Normally, those proteins will remain in the cell, in the cytosol, doing something functional within the cell. But the viral proteins, in particular the N protein, that nucleocapsid protein, is made in the cytosol, and it gets complexed with viral RNA. Now, here's something else that happens. One of these proteins becomes the, not just one of these proteins, actually, that whole uh, 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 open reading frame 1A and 1B make a complex of proteins that replicate that RNA. So that original RNA that gets into the cell gets replicated, a whole bunch of, of pieces get replicated, and then they start to complex with the N. And so now you've got a bunch of viral uh, genomes complex with their nucleocapsid proteins, and somehow that gets pulled over to one of these vesicles that has the S, M, and E proteins embedded in it. So the next part is not entirely clear in the literature. There's a, uh, different sources are saying different things, but the current thinking is that once all of this is together, once you have the um, uh, RNA and it's complex with the nucleocapsid proteins, and the vesicle complex with the S, E, and M proteins, among others, somehow the vesicle envelops that nucleic acid strand, and it goes then to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus then puts sugar moieties, sugar groups, onto some of the proteins, and then releases a vesicle that contains pro the uh, various assemblies of the virions, the viruses. That vesicle then goes to the surface of the cell and is released, and all those viruses are released out from the cell at that point. Now, one thing I do want to point out, if you study this uh, sort of process of viral replication, uh, you'll sometimes hear people talk about the cell building a bunch of viruses to the point where there's so many viruses in the cell, the cell ruptures and releases the virus. That's a common pattern that you see in bacteria, but not in human cells. Human cells are more like this. This is called viral shedding or viral budding. The viruses shed and out, uh, outside the cell, and there's no reason why this cell has to die. In fact, it's not always clear exactly how it is that the virus kills the cell. Uh, and in this case, then, exactly how the virus affects the cell is still being worked out. But that's the basic uh, biology of coronaviruses. Okay, so another question, though, is what about SARS coronavirus 2? How does it perform, or what variations does it have on this basic theme? Now, before we get into that question, we really should take a look at what we know about the others, because there are some variations. So let's take a look, then, at the two different uh, severe disease-causing viruses that we know of, the SARS covirus and the MERS covirus. SARS covirus, uh, the original one, enters the cells using this ACE2 receptor. ACE stands for angiotensin-converting enzyme. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, receptor that's on cells, primarily in the lungs, but also in other parts of the body as well, uh, because ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme, is, is one of the key uh, enzymes in controlling blood pressure. Once this virus binds to the receptor, the spike protein binds to it, that's when all these events occur that allow the, the virus into the cell. Then once the virus is in the cell, the nucleocapsid and the rest of the virus is uncoated, 
and the messenger RNA, the, the viral RNA, is free now in the cytosol. Like we saw before, ribosomes then come and bind to those sections of the uh, viral RNA, which, has, uh, which have the genes, and they start making these giant proteins. And the proteins, again, are polyproteins, which have to get cleaved and cut up by proteolytic enzymes, proteases, that are enzymes that break proteins up. And when they do, they take all these cleavage products, all the protein pieces that they broke up, and they start to assemble the various parts of the, of the, uh, uh, the virus together. One of the uh, set of those proteins comes together to form this big complex called the replicase. And the replicase goes back to the original RNA and makes copies of it. And then it makes copies of the copies. It makes copies of the copies. And so you end up with an enormous number of viral genomes that end up being copied and it's free in the cytosol. So one viral genome gets in and a bunch of copies are made from it. These other proteins are then uh, constructed elsewhere in the cell. As we saw before, some of them are constructed on the endoplasmic reticulum, some of them in the cytosol. But as you can see here, all of those proteins we talked about before, the SME proteins, are then made here. Now, this picture shows a slight variation of uh, the one that I showed you before. It has these proteins being made in the ER. They go to the Golgi apparatus, and then they go and are, are constructed into vesicles that surround the, uh, the virus. Uh, that is different than the picture that, uh, that we had seen in some of these other uh, uh, cases. It's actually currently thought that that spiral assembly occurs between the ER and the Golgi apparatus. But either way, what eventually happens is the vesicle goes to the surface of the cell and then releases the virus particle out into the uh, intracellular space, and then it gets picked up by the blood and spread throughout the body. All right, so that's the picture for SARS. But what about MERS? The picture for MERS is similar. It has a receptor, but in this case, the receptor is different. Instead of the receptor being ACE2, the receptor for the MERS virus is DPP4. Otherwise, it's the same. Once that viral particle, once the uh, spike protein in particular binds to the DPP4, it then gets ingested, goes through all the same processes that I just showed you, and the viral particles are then shed through this process of exocytosis. Okay, so that's the picture for the known coronaviruses that cause severe disease in humans, SARS-CoV-1, the original, and MERS. But what about SARS-CoV-2, the one we're dealing with right now? The question is, how does it enter cells? One of the things you have to realize is we can't just say, well, they're similar, so let's assume that it uses the same basic pathway. We have to look at this carefully, because if it doesn't use that pathway, and we try to treat it based on the faulty assumption, we are making a very, very nasty mistake. So what should we do here? Well, we've got to, like we said with the bologna detection kit, consider many different hypotheses. What are the possibilities? It's pretty obvious, since our uh, friend here looks a lot like the original SARS-CoV virus, we might say, well, let's see if it actually uses ACE2, just like the original SARS-CoV virus does. But again, it also is similar to the mers cov virus, so maybe it's using DPP4. But the other possibility is that it's using neither one. It's doing something novel and new to, uh, that we've never seen before. So that's our next question. What is it that the SARS-CoV-2 is using to actually enter the cells? Because that becomes a really nice therapeutic target. Oftentimes when we try to treat viruses, we use drugs that block the viral entry into cells. And that's one of the reasons why it is, it's so critical that we understand this. So what we want to do is look at this very carefully. And a particular study, one of the first ones that was done, actually pretty well definitively showed what was going on. What they did is they looked specifically at that open reading frame that we saw, I'm sorry, the spike protein uh, reading frame that we saw before, that S protein. It turns out the S protein has two different sections of its gene, S1 and S2. The S1 is an attachment site, the S2 is a fusion site. The S1, by attachment, what they mean is that's what attaches to whatever receptor happens to be uh, whatever uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, is binding to. And the fusion protein, the fusion section of that protein, has to do with binding the membranes together and allowing the cell to ingest that, uh, the virus. So this is the N terminal domain, this is the C terminal domain, meaning if you remember when we build proteins, we build them from the uh, uh, amino acid end or the amino end to the acid end, to the carboxyl end. And if you look here, these are sequences of letters that you've seen before. Each one of these letters represents a particular amino acid. So they're looking specifically at the receptor binding domain, RBD, and in particular 
they're looking at one section of the receptor binding domain, which is called the receptor binding motif. Motif being a uh, sort of a pattern that you see in any kind of a sequence in this context. So if you look here, this top line is the original SARS virus, which we know uses ACE2. And the FRA1 is just simply a, a, a designation for the exact strain that they, that they uh, use, the exact source that they use. And this section right here for the receptor binding motif has this amino acid sequence NTR and blah, 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 blah. And it comes along like this. Now, these other ones here, these other virus strains right here, are not necessarily SARS disease causing viruses, but there are other viruses that use ACE2 in the same kind of spike protein. And you can see they have almost identical sequences, almost exactly the same. So this is the key. This, sec this section right here, the RBMC section, is really, really highly conserved, meaning it's similar among all species that use ACE2. And that makes sense because, again, this is the part of the protein that binds to ACE. So they should be very similar. Now here's our SARS. Uh, two. This is the co covirus, uh, coronavirus 2. And then there are these two other ones that they are looking at, and these are, are uh, coronaviral strains that do not use ACE2 to bind. Now remember, there's a lot of coronaviruses in bats, and that's where a lot of these come from. So if you look, there's quite a bit of differences. Uh, if you look here, there's a key difference or key differences. In fact, every place where there's a key difference, you see they have highlighted it with gray. So these sequences here are critical. In fact, there's a big deletion right there. These sequences then show that there's quite a bit of difference between the ACE2 binding group and the ACE2 uh, non-binding group. Now, let's compare SARS to the binding group and the non-binding group. And if you see, look at each place, especially where, the, where there are, are gray boxes. There are some differences, but notice how the SARS-2, our, our SARS that we're dealing with now, doesn't have this deletion or that deletion or this deletion. And it otherwise is much, much more like the ACE2 binding group than the non-binding group. So that tends to suggest that at least that binding domain for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is more like the ACE2 binding uh, viruses than the ACE2 non-binding viruses. Still not sufficient evidence for us to say that uh, sars coronavirus 2 uses ACE2, but it certainly tells us that we're looking in the right direction. So here then is what appears to be the case. If you look at that spike protein, this is a picture that shows the sort of cartoonish view of it. These are the, the nucleocapsid proteins and so on. But if you look at that spike protein, which has uh, the sections S1 and S2, the attachment section and the uh, fusion section, if you look at the tertiary structure, this is what it looks like. That's the head of it. And the part that we're talking about, this part here, this receptor binding domain, is highlighted right there. That's the receptor binding domain. And what appears to be the case is this. You have the tertiary structure of that receptor binding domain right here. And this is the tertiary structure of the ACE2. And you notice that they fit reasonably well. And again, that makes sense because these, this amino acid sequence is very similar to the ACE2 binding domains of other species. Okay, great. More evidence that, in fact, we're binding ACE2 and that if we're going to, buy, to develop a drug, we should try to develop a drug that binds or blocks the binding of the receptor binding domain with ACE2. But again, that's not quite sufficient. Just showing that the proteins bind to each other is not sufficient for us to say that that's the protein that's required to get the virus inside the cell. We need to be able to see that. And that then was a, was a continuation of this study done by Hoffman and, his, and, and that group. That group showed uh, this data set. If you look at this axis here, this is showing how many viruses get into the cells. And these groups right here, 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 these are different viral strains. This is a virus that essentially infects everything and they're using it as a positive control. Here is the original SARS covirus. Uh, this is S, for, they're selling for the S protein. So this is the SARS coronavirus. This is SARS coronavirus 2. That's what we're dealing with now. This is another virus I'm not going to talk much about, but here's the MERS uh, coronavirus. That's the one that caused the 2012 outbreak. Now, what they did is this. They exposed these viruses. Now, these aren't the full viruses. This is There's a little bit of a nuance here. They actually put the protein in on another virus, a, v, a VSV virus. Uh, but it's it, they showed in another part of the paper that this worked perfectly. Uh, the, they exposed different cells that, to these different viruses. And the cells could be either 
ha uh, expressing human ACE2, that's what the H stands for. They could be expressing bat ACE2, so that's the, that's the gene that produces angiotensin converting enzyme in bats. Another protein, APN, and another protein, DPP4. Now remember that human DPP4 is what MERS uses to infect cells. Okay, so here let's look at the data. What we're looking at here is all four possibilities. That's the human ACE2, bat ACE2, human APN, and human DPP4. In the positive control, notice the positive control entered all those cells, meaning this. None of these are required or necessary for this particular virus to get into these cells. So that means that the system is working. That's your positive control showing that it works. Now remember what these bars mean, that those three uh, uh, asterisks mean that this is significantly different than these others. Okay, now let's look at the original SARS. This is the SARS spike protein. Notice the only two cells that got infected by the original SARS were the cells that expressed human ACE2 and bat ACE2. Essentially no cells that expressed only APN or DPP4 got infected by SARS. That makes sense because they already know that the SARS, uh, original SARS, infects through ACE2. Okay, now let's take a look then at MERS. MERS, notice it does not infect the cells that express ACE2, either human or bat. It also doesn't infect cells that uh, uh, infect, uh, use APN. This particular strain does use APN, so this is kind of a negative positive control. This is showing that the, that the system works. But notice for the MERS, the cells that got infected were only those cells that express human DPP4 which again we know makes sense because MERS uses that to get into the cells. Now here's our virus right here, SARS coronavirus 2. All right, it's pretty obvious, but I'll ask it, is this more like the original SARS coronavirus or is it more like MERS 2? Oh, well, look at it, it's obviously the same as the original SARS coronavirus. So this SARS coronavirus is showing high entry of the cells that are expressing ACE2, either human or bat, because that's what they use to get in. The current SARS that we're dealing with right now is exactly the same. It can get in using ACE2 or bat ACE2, either from the human or the, or the bat. So there's more to this paper, but that's reasonably definitive. That pretty much shows that that, that picture that we saw, of the two proteins binding, has a functional significance. It actually is involved and is important in getting the uh, uh, virus to infect cells. But there's more to the story. If you look at how it is that SARS enters cells, they, there's a second part of this whole process that, that is critical in its ability to get inside cells. And so they were looking at this with SARS. Let me show you how they did it. Now here, what they're looking at is the same sort of thing. They're looking at the entry of the virus into cells. That's what this axis is representing. Here's the VSVG, which is the positive control. Here's the original SARS, and here's the sars cov uh, 2 This is the one we're dealing with now. Now, they're not going to do MERS because we've already seen in the previous data set that the MERS isn't really involved. It's, it's very different, uh, whereas our SARS-2 is the same as SARS-S. Now, here, they made cells that either do or do not express this protein here, which has this awful name, TMRPRSS2. This particular uh, protein is a, a proteolytic protein. It, it will uh, actually bind to proteins and split them apart, and break them in, into a particular uh, place where there's a serine residue, a serine amino acid. This E64D is a drug that will block all other proteases like that, all the proteolytic enzymes like that, uh, that break into serine, except TMPRSS2. Okay, now, here is the study. Now, this is what we call a two-factor study. What they have is they're looking at cells that express TMP RSS2 in the presence of the drug or not. Okay, now the negative sign here, here, and here mean that this, these are cell lines that do not express the, this TMP RSS2. These pluses and minuses are representing experiments that they did either putting in this drug, which blocks all other proteolytic enzymes, uh, or not. Okay, so if we take a look at the positive control, this first blue bar is where a cell line does not express TMPRSS2 and did have the drug E64D, no problem, they got, into the, they got into the cells, no problem. This one, they used a cell line that does express TMPRSS2 and did not put the drug, again it gets in, no problem. 
And then this line, it's both expressing this uh, enzyme and also has the drug, and they all got in. So again, that's why it's the positive control. It just shows that no matter what they do, this particular enzyme, which doesn't use ACE or TMPRSS2 or anything else, will get into the cells. But now look at the original SARS. Here, again, does not express T, uh, TMPRSS2, but did have the drug? Nothing. There was nothing there. The, 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 the could not, they could not essentially uh, get into the cells. Here, however, if you do have a cell line that's TMPRSS2, but without the drug, it gets into the cells. So something about having either missing the drug or having TMPRSS2 uh, uh, is allowing these into the cells. So the key result is this one, where we're expressing both the protein and the, the drug was, in, uh, it, it was given to the cells. And notice, having that TMPRSS2 rescues the effect of the drug of E64D because all of those guys were able to get into the cells, no problem. So this is the key point. This thing right here is critical in getting into cells. And it, again, its function is to break proteins down, is to, is, to, is to cut them at the particular serine residues. And this drug, which would otherwise kill that virus and allow, not allow it in, is rescued. Uh, when you actually put in that uh, uh, proteolytic enzyme. Okay, so that's the original SARS. Let's look at SARS covirus 2. All right, well, I'll just look at it. You tell me. I mean, these are exactly identical, which is showing essentially that this and this, these two SARS, are the same. Not only do they use ACE, ACE2, which is what this data set shows, but the viral entry requires TMPRSS2 as well. So here's our current picture. What appears to happen in order to get the, the cell to become infected is that the coronavirus, both SARS coronavirus original one and our SARS coronavirus two, must bind the ACE2 receptor. Once it's bound to the ACE2 receptor, then this enzyme, the TMPRSS2, comes over and breaks the ACE2. It literally cleaves the ACE2 into two pieces. Somehow that activates the spike protein and appears to allow that fusion section, the fusion domain, to then do its job. Fuse this membrane of the virus with this membrane of the cell. Once that happens, then the cell can enter and go through the rest of the life cycle. Here's the problem. The rest of the life cycle is probably like SARS coronavirus, the original, but we're still not sure. There's still research being done on that right now. But the reason why this is so important is that there exist drugs that inhibit this TMPRSS2, and they're already clinically approved. So right now, that's a therapeutic target, and people are currently doing uh, uh, clinical trials to see if that drug will help protect against SARS coronavirus 2.